For, um, for this next panel, it's my great honor to introduce our featured seminar speaker, Callum Roberts. We're offering these seminars over the course of uh, this symposium to provide, quote unquote, deep dives. Uh, yeah, I have to work in maritime uh, metaphors as much as I can in this job. Uh, we, um, we try to offer these deep dives throughout um, the symposium for special topics. And for this topic, how we shape our ocean, I could think of no better guide than Callum Roberts. Callum is a marine scientist and conservationist at the University of York in England. We're delighted that he crossed the pond to be here this week. But more than that, Callum is a storyteller. And for those of you who were here this morning, you, for the author's coffee, you got to see why. Callum has a special gift for translating facts, figures, and trends that might otherwise be very boring to the average reader into really powerful and compelling narratives that teach us about ourselves and our world, and in particular about our ocean. Uh, it was in 2007 that he wrote uh, Unnatural History of the Sea, uh, which charts the effects of a thousand years of human impacts on the sea. And his current book, uh, Ocean of Life, is right here in my hands. And um, thanks to Callum for signing it for me just a little while ago. And is on sale at our Chow bookstore, uh, just to my left and your right. And I encourage you to head there after this seminar to pick a copy of Callum's book. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Callum and bring him up to the podium. Well, thank you very much. And it's a, a great pleasure to be here and to have uh, the, 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 the luxury of a bit more time than this morning, uh, where six minutes seem to fly by in about uh, <laughs> 2.5 minutes for me. And, and so I'd only barely got through my first anecdote when uh, it was time to get off. <laughs> so this, this, this uh, is a great opportunity for me to, to, to come and talk to such a well-informed audience. And uh, uh, what I want to try and do is to um, take you through some of the, uh, the, the, the things that I discovered and that, that I was uh, trying to pull together in the writing of this book, uh, which took a year less than the, the Unnatural History of the Sea took to write. So it was four years in the making as opposed to five. So I'm, I'm on a roll now, and uh, I, I better try and do the next book in three years. And then uh, by the time that I finally get to retirement age, I might be tossing them off at the rate of one every six months. <laughs> Unlikely, as it seems. But anyway, uh, so let's fire away. This is, this is where it all began in terms of our relationship with the oceans uh, in recorded history, as in uh, recorded by archaeological remains. And this is a, a cave in South Africa. Uh, its name is rather prosaic. It sounds like a condo address. And indeed, it lies, it lies below the ninth hole of the Pinnacle Point Resort and condominium development in, in South Africa. And, uh, uh, there's quite a lot of controversy because the irrigation of the, uh, the, the said green uh, is causing some damage to the cave. But the interesting thing about the, this cave and, and others like it along that piece of coast is that written within the sediments uh, and the dirt in the bottom of the cave is the story of our emerging, uh, our, our emerging humanity. And uh, this is our own species that lived in this cave. And 140,000 years ago, right up there at the earliest levels of occupation, uh, we were catching um, seafood. And in fact, uh, this kind of mollusk was uh, part of thick layers of deposits in these caves. And, and we find other sorts of evidence of what people were doing at that time uh, embedded within these layers of various seafoods uh, uh, and uh, the remains of the bones of land animals as well. And, and so we can see by about 77,000 years ago, people had learned to really make some extremely elegant um, uh, weapons uh, by heat treating the rock before they flaked it. And that meant you could get much finer points. And it's about this time that we see the um, introduction of fish bones into the deposits. And so people were pr probably starting to harpoon the fish as they came up to feed on the on the, uh, in the shallows there with the rising tide. And then we see uh, the emergence of um, 
uh, in fact, a little bit earlier, the emergence of jewelry, uh, the, the, the creation of uh, necklaces from uh, little shells which have been pierced. And in fact, they, they made use of the piercings that had been made by uh, little boring mollusks. And um, so this, this is the, the, the first documented evidence of ornamentation about 120,000 years ago. And then later on, we get the emergence of abstract art. Uh, well, actually, it's a few scratch marks on a piece of ochre, but paleontology, no, archaeologists will make a lot out of uh, very little in order to uh, further their careers. They're quite shameless in this respect. <laughs> so anyway, that's where it all be began. And uh, there are some who believe that we owe uh, our big brains and our intelligence to our relationship with the sea and seafood, and indeed maybe uh, our bipedalism as well was an adaptation to wading in water to collect shellfish, for example. Now, uh, again, uh, physiologists will stretch the point a little bit as well based on the evidence, but I'm going to as well, and uh, I'm going to suggest that what we really do know about uh, uh, modern humans is that they did use the coast a great deal, and if we track the emergence of our species out of Africa and the subsequent colonization of the world, you can see um, that there was an early out of Africa uh, phase which, um, which happened a long, long time ago uh, uh, and went across Asia and so forth. And this was a uh, Homo erectus and um, uh, Java man and so on that we, we uh, uh, see the remains of in Indonesia. But then there's the, the migration of modern humans out of Africa and it seems from genetic evidence that, it mo that they move very rapidly across the northern Indian Ocean following the coast along this, uh, this purple route right down here. And uh, they made it to Australia by 50,000 years ago. Now what is interesting about that is there's a big water gap uh, to Australia and uh, they had to make the leap of that. And so it suggests that they had some kind of seafaring technology and indeed uh, if we look at cave deposits, um, there's some very recent evidence from Jeremalai Cave in East Timor, uh, which shows that uh, uh, the, the oldest fish hooks in the world, which are 16 to 23,000 years old, but the, the deposits of fish bones in those caves go back much deeper in time, all the way to 42,000 years ago. And uh, in among those bones is shark and tuna, which suggests that we had some kind of mastery over the, 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 the seafaring techniques to be able to get out there off the reef to exploit those species effectively. And then on to the Americas. And so we see uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, another hypothesis erected on the basis of, uh, uh, I think, much more solid facts this time uh, by John Erlinson and colleagues, which is that the idea that people followed a kelp highway around the Pacific Rim and they colonized their way down the Americas uh, by uh, using very familiar uh, uh, food resources that were in among the kelp forests. Uh, they, they basically found the same sort of things all the way around the Pacific Rim. It enabled them to colonize very rapidly and you can see that in this point in, in southern South America, that's 14 and a half thousand years before present, that archaeological site. So there, there seems to have been a very rapid colonization. And then there's one of those theoretical gaps, uh, which we have to somehow reconcile with the idea of kelp, uh, which is um, in the middle where there is no kelp. And uh, so coral reefs and kelp, obviously very substitutable. So we'll, we'll give them that for now. Now, if you want to find the origins of commercial fishing, uh, we have to go fast forward a very long time. But even so, the, the antiquity of commercial fishing is really rather surprisingly old. And uh, we can go to the Black Sea back uh, four or 5,000 years ago and find people were stuffing uh, uh, these sorts of uh, clay containers up here, the, uh, the amphorae with uh, tuna and catfish and sturgeon, and they were shipping it hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. And then by a thousand years later, 2,000 years ago in the Western Mediterranean, the, the entire Western Mediterranean rim was circled by uh, large fish processing factories like this one in Spain. And you can see here these, uh, these big vats, and in these vats uh, they were uh, producing fish sauces, uh, and uh, right alongside, they were making the amphorae and they were shipping it across 
uh, to the farthest reaches of the Roman Empire and sites in Germany, about two-thirds of the amphoras found had uh, fish sauce remains in them. Now, of course, it was not to everyone's taste, uh, the fish sauces of the time, and uh, they were rather pungent. And uh, one uh, 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 early observer, Seneca, said that it's nothing more than the overpriced guts of rotted fish. And uh, uh, there's a good reason why most of these fish processing factories are well outside the city walls in the, in the sites that they're located in. Now, of course, coming from the, the east, uh, uh, there's also uh, an influence of seafood on the colonization, or at least the visitation of North America from Europe. And um, we see that the Vikings were the first here from, from Europe, or, or at least so we uh, believe. And they, they would have brought with them fish rather like this. This, this is the, uh, the, the northern European equivalent of biltong. Uh, it's uh, plank hard, dried cod from northern Norway, and it could be transported long distances. You could keep it uh, for uh, two or three years before it went off. And, and so this was a perfect kind of convenience food for uh, long distance travel in the age before refrigeration. Now, the thing about uh, looking at this great span of human history is that we haven't needed to worry about what we've taken from the oceans uh, for most of that time. There, there's always been plenty. There's always been more than we've needed. Uh, it's a matter of pick and choose what you want to take. And you can see from this all, uh, admittedly fanciful uh, depiction of a fish market from Europe in the, in the 17th century uh, the kinds of things which were on display. Uh, now, no fishmonger... Uh, her, her worth the name would have come up with such a chaotic display of fish. Uh, it, it's ridiculous to think so, but uh, you can see the, the sizes of fish that were available at that time uh, from this display. And, and foremost among them really is this uh, magnificent sturgeon here, but there's also halibut. Uh, there's uh, unusual fish like lampreys. There's familiar ones like the cod. Here's a wolf fish. I'll be coming back to the wolf fish in a little bit. And then there are other things that we haven't uh, uh, been uh, eating for some time, most of us. Uh, things like the seals down here, uh, the porpoise uh, uh, here, and then there's the, the large common skate, which is no longer common. So you can get a, a sense of the abundance and the size of these sorts of animals that were, were on offer. Now, it all began to really change with the industrialization of fishing fleets, and that happened at the, in the late 19th century. And you can see from this uh, picture of a fishing port on the east coast of the United Kingdom uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, just the kind of fishing power that we had by then. And, and adding engines to boats just changed all the rules. It moved fisheries from being local and serving uh, uh, relatively limited needs to being uh, a, a commodity that could be fished from far afield, got back to market fresh, and then of course we had the railways expanding inland that we could get them to the inland cities. And, uh, and that again greatly increased um, demand. And so uh, the amount of fishing effort was ramped up to meet that demand. Now, this is the sort of uh, 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 landings that you could expect in those early, heady days of exploitation. Uh, and uh, fish markets like this one in Aberdeen, Scotland, were filled with huge fish that had been taken out and uh, were so big that they were sold individually. Uh, and you can see the ranks over here. Uh, this is Ling, uh, a, a cod relative. And here are a whole bunch of cod, and there's probably some skates in the background up here, but the halibuts are, are alongside. So a remarkable uh, image of, of the abundance of the fisheries uh, and the productivity of the fisheries that we had at that time. And then another technological innovation that ramped up fishing power and uh, our ability to exploit further afield was from your own Clarence Birdseye, who invented flash freezing technology, and uh, not only uh, increased the range over which people could operate, but also expanded the range of species that could be sold fresh. Uh, and so haddock really hadn't been a big part of sales up to this time because it spoiled much more rapidly than cod. And so um, the, the, the fast freezing really uh, introduced new species. Problem was that we also started to see the buildup of impacts on the ocean environment, and, and haddock um, was one thing which under 
underwent a spectacular decline in the 1920s. And that was perhaps one of the things that spurred uh, Rachel Carson to uh, suggest that people shouldn't be just restricting their attention to a few um, uh, commonplace fish that they'd always been buying, but to uh, experiment. Uh, you know, be, be, uh, live dangerously, go and fi buy something else. And so she wrote this pamphlet, uh, Food from the Sea, which encouraged people to try new kinds of seafood. Now, one of the uh, kinds of seafood that she uh, suggested that people go out and, uh, and buy was the, the wolf fish, otherwise known as the catfish. And here you can see some wolf fish being processed in the port of Hull in England in the 1960s. Uh, uh, and you can see why it was appealing as a substitute for cod, because it had um, incredibly firm white flesh. Uh, mostly it was processed before the, the housewife ever saw it, because um, it's quite a bruiser when you, you, you look at a, a wolf fish. They're very beautiful animals, though. I, I think they're particularly lovely with their mottled skins. They're also made into purses and handbags, incidentally. <laughs> and for reasons I will show you in a moment, don't buy one. Oh, here's a few small fish on the auction room floor waiting to be picked up. Oh. <laughs> Not so small after all. So this is what happened to wolf fish catches into the UK. Uh, and uh, we can see from the point when records first began uh, in 1889 to all the way to the present. And you can see that wolf fish landings exploded through the, uh, the, the middle of the 20th century. We, whoops, uh, where are we? There we go. I'm pointing the wrong thing. But this is about the, the, the sort of, uh, actually, this is where Rachel Carson was writing. And it was very dangerous to go fishing then. That's what these two valleys are, is the, uh, is the world wars. And uh, people weren't taking their boats out at that time. So really, the, the important part of this graph, the message is that uh, catches go up and then they crash down. There's almost no wolf fish around anymore. Now, another uh, species that Rachel Carson suggested we should all get our teeth into was the uh, Acadian rosefish. And this occurs deeper down in the Gulf of Maine and, uh, uh, you know, had been largely thrown away until uh, she um, started making her suggestions. And, and where you can argue whether it was Rachel Carson or whether it was just going to happen anyway that people would start eating these things. Uh, but this is what happened to the uh, landings of Acadian redfish. And uh, again, I shall put on this the point where Rachel Carson is giving her advice. You can see it was uh, abundant. It was a new resource. And yet since then, things have gone spectacularly wrong. We have intensively exploited the Acadian redfish. Now that brings me forward to uh, the present. And um, one of the, the, the difficulties that we've had in exploiting the oceans is that we, we have uh, caused a whole variety of other changes to the marine environment, as well as simply extracting fish. It's not a nice, clean process. And the methods that we use cause uh, quite a bit of collateral damage. So about a month and a half ago, I visited the Irish Sea, uh, uh, which is sandwiched between Ireland and uh, the mainland UK, with this um, uh, television presenter and celebrity f uh, chef uh, from the UK called Hugh Fernley Whittingstall. And he's, he's a bit of a campaigner against overfishing, and he's turning his attention to marine protected areas. We were there to compare and contrast two areas. One was a bay that had been protected from trawlers and scallop dredges for 22 years. And the other was a nearby area which had been just fished by the scallop dredges uh, willy-nilly for uh, the same sort of period of time. Now, to give you context to the Irish Sea and the, the fisheries there, here's a graph that we put together of the landings of fish from the Irish Sea. These are all bottom fish that you would expect to catch using bottom trawlers and so forth. You can see here the the, the, the World War II dip uh, in landings. But other than that, there's, a, there's kind of a dynamical stability over most of this time series. Things, things go up and they go down. That's the nature of the marine environment. It fluctuates a great deal. But you can see something different happening at the end of the time series. So since 1990 or so, we have seen this spectacular crash in uh, the uh, abundance or the landings of these bottom living fish. 
And if I simplify this graph for you a little bit, you can see the green line at the top is the, the aggregated landings. And if you're a glass is half full kind of person, then you, you'll be able to say, well, actually, we're, we're catching just about the same today as we did in uh, 1930. So what's the problem? Uh, and then you look at the, the fin fish, the bottom fish that I was talking about. Well, they, they have just fallen off this cliff right here. And what is sustaining the landings now is the invertebrates. So the, the scallops, principally, and the prawns. So uh, let's, let's just turn to the scallops first. Well, when we dived in the bay that had been protected, it was wonderful going down onto the seabed because as, as the, 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 the bottom hove into view, it looked like this field of waving grass. And that was all the hydroids that were there. And then in among the hydroids, there were just thousands of brittle stars. And they all had their arms up and were catching uh, uh, little bits of floating particles. And then between them on the seabed, you could see loads of anemones and, and uh, uh, worms with their, their tentacles out feeding. Uh, and among them, there were huge uh, dinner plate sized scallops in depressions on the seabed, and everything had encrusting sponges on it and bryozoans and all sorts of different life. And every rock that was there was encrusted in a whole variety of life. And then we dived in the other place, and I'd expected it to be, uh, you know, somewhat different, but I had, I, nothing had prepared me in all the reading that I've done about the impacts of trawling and dredging for what I actually saw. And that was as as we came down towards the seabed, it looked like a, a six-lane highway. You know, you had all of these uh, uh, scrape marks going off into the distance, parallel lines. And looking among them, if you, if you dug your hand into the sand, there was nothing on the sand, so, you know, there was no, <laughs> you weren't interrupting anything. Uh, I dug your hand into the sand, nothing there. And I only saw four living things and one dying thing on that entire dive. There was... Um, there were two undersized scallops, two sea urchins, and a, a smashed clam that had been destroyed by the, the last pass of a scallop dredge. And it, it was almost cleaned out. So in, in catching scallops, and yes, I'm afraid the, uh, the Isle of Man scallop fishery has been MSC certified and it's all sustainable and everything. But in catching those scallops, we have lost everything else. This is a fishery of last resort. And here, are some of the things that have disappeared as a result of intensifying those fisheries and moving down the food web to, to scallops and prawns. And you can see, you know, the halibut, the angel sharks, the common skates, the fan mussels, the whole panoply of things that occupy the seabed have gone uh, uh, alongside those scallops. And here's the other, the other part of the, uh, the duo of uh, scallop dredging and trawling. Now we have moved to fine mesh nets because uh, prawns are quite small, really. And what you can see here, here's the target catch. There's one or two of them. Um, but all of this is the seabed habitat and all of the juveniles of everything else. There are still a few juveniles out there, but they're not making it to adulthood. They're not making it to reproductive age. They've been essentially eliminated or sidelined within the ecosystem by the intensification of fishing. So uh, while we're on the subject of bycatch, <clears throat> who likes a mahi-mahi sandwich? <laughs> Quite a few of you, yeah? Well, mahi-mahi, uh, for those of you who follow this, these things, is considered generally to be quite a good choice because these are animals that live fast, they grow rapidly, they reproduce early, and so they're considered to be quite a sustainable and uh, green choice. Now, they're caught using trolling or long lining, and uh, here's... The, 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 the problem, when you catch them using long lines, you don't just catch mahi-mahi. Now, in this case, this, this, I, I've got these figures from a study of Costa Rica, which was looking at the bycatch of mahi-mahi uh, uh, fishery. And they were trialing these circle hooks, which are turtle friendly, of course, because uh, circle hooks don't uh, catch turtles, whereas J hooks do, and, and uh, you know, all the collateral damage there. So this is what this um, experimental fishery caught. Uh, and the, you know, the first thing, here's your circle hooks, great. Uh, have thresher sharks, we got green turtles, silky sharks, pelagic stingrays, devil rays, smooth hammerheads, oceanic white tips, crocodile sharks, striped marlin, the elephant tuna, blue marlin, wahoo, swordfish, and sunfish, even sunfish are getting caught um, in this kind of fishery. Now, I'm not saying that 
None of these bycatch species have any commercial value. In fact, uh, quite a few of them are used, and especially the sharks now uh, are being stripped of their fins. They have uh, an intrinsic value. But it, I just find it pretty grotesque that we are using fishing methods that are so deeply unselective, and we're, we're stripping the oceans of their megafauna in pursuit of uh, enough fish here, 211 mahi-mahi, to feed one lunch to the occupants of two average-sized city office blocks if they all had the mahi-mahi option at lunchtime. Now, of course, I've concentrated on exploitation up to now, but uh, there's a lot more going on in the sea. And what I was trying to do in the book was to, to bring things together. So I'm just going to be very selective and rattle through a few of, uh, of the changes. Well, obviously, global climate change is a, a massive effect on the sea. And sure enough, we are seeing the seas warming under the influence of increased greenhouse gas emissions. And, and the real kind of uh, uh, canary in the coal mine, as everyone likes to call it, uh, of global warming effects is the impacts on coral reefs. And what strikes me is, is just how unnoticed this has been by the, the, the general public out there. And if we roll back the clock to 1998 uh, in the Indian Ocean, a massive warming event that caused the destruction of three quarters to 90% of all of the corals in the Indian Ocean. And yet, are we talking about it today outside these sorts of rooms? If three quarters to 90% of the trees in the United States had withered and died that year, you know, there would be great plans being drawn up. We would have, uh, uh, you know, presidential uh, commissions to uh, do something about the trees, but it isn't happening to nearly the same degree in the oceans. And unfortunately, this is what you end up with a few years after uh, those bleaching events. And in many places, there's been very little recovery of any kind. <clears throat> now, the other thing that the, the, uh, the warming is doing is to uh, it, it increase <clears throat> the mixing of species from place to place. And so there's great, this great diaspora of life uh, is, is moving now with the, the, the warming fronts of the sea into places that they didn't occur before. And, and at, at the other end of the distribution, there are places that are becoming inclement, which were formerly uh, really rather enjoyable for them. And so we're seeing ecosystems being reshaped by um, this uh, movement of species in ways that we're, are going to have unpredictable outcomes and potentially very significant effects on the uh, environment. Now, here's an example from the Southern Ocean, uh, where um, scantily clad ladies have been invading the uh, uh, Antarctica. No, actually, uh, <laughs> it's the crab monsters. And, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and what's happening is that the Antarctica has been pretty much crab-free for a very long time. It's not a great place for a crab to enjoy life. There are physiological limits to their existence there, but it's warming up. And now we're seeing king crabs moving up into the Antarctic, and they are certainly going to have major influences on Antarctic ecosystems that are ir irreversible. I mean, we, we are essentially watching uh, spellbound or otherwise as these changes unfold. And at the other si uh, uh, pole of the planet, We've uh, seen the, um, the much sought after Northwest Passage at last opening up. You know, um, uh, Franklin lost his life and, uh, and so did Hudson in the search for the Northwest Passage. They never found it because it didn't exist. And yet now we're seeing on a, a, a fairly regular basis this passage is opening up from the Pacific into the Atlantic. And even to the extent that this remarkable uh, uh, animal turned up in Israeli waters in 2010, a gray whale, and it had to come all the way from the Pacific as the last gray whale was seen in the Atlantic in the 18th century. And you, you have to ask yourself, what did this poor whale think? <laughs> it was just wondering, what on earth have I done? <laughs> And then, of course, there's sea level rise uh, coming. And uh, you know, there are certain cities where you would hope that this was the outcome, but uh, I, won't <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I won't name any of them. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, they, you know, it's, it's hard for people to grasp that the, the sea is rising every year uh, uh, by something like half the thickness of, of my finger. You know, so 
that, that, that just is, is difficult to grasp and it's difficult to ignore as well. And we are going to have to prepare for it. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the things are really bad. This is the uh, predictions from the 1990 International Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, looking at the uh, expected scenario of sea level rise and the, and the best case and the worst case. And unfortunately, we are tracking the worst case scenario almost perfectly right now. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the warming influence is, is uh, really continuing unabated and it, it's possible it's even accelerating uh, as a result of um, uh, the, the increasing size of the human population and increasing affluence. And now, uh, when we, you take into account the instabilities of ice sheets, we could be looking at a one meter sea level rise uh, by 2100 and that's the thickness of my finger every year. Uh, and um, this, this is going to be uh, a, a very tough to respond to. And of course, we uh, immediately reach for the engineered solutions to the problem of sea level rise. And, and there are many people who uh, want to make a lot of money um, armor plating the coasts. And, and of course, we're going to have to do that in many places. There are uh, areas of extremely important assets like Manhattan, for example, that we are going to want to defend in ways like this. But in defending like this, we lose something which is enormously important, and that is the, the coastal wetlands. Uh, and, and those are being squeezed out. And that's a problem because coastal wetlands themselves are probably one of our biggest allies in the fight against sea level rise because they are uh, able, in many cases, to, to, to build progressively as the sea level rises. But they're also very important for a whole range of other ecological functions, for example, purifying water and uh, filtering runoff from the land and uh, providing nurseries for a lot of the fish that we depend on from the sea. And then there, one of the responses to uh, the uh, problems of overfishing that we're seeing, and, and the, one of the panelists was discussing aquaculture. So here's a bit of aquaculture from the Bohai Sea in China. And you can see that there is no kind of natural coast left. There is just this uh, enormous expanse of fish and prawn ponds here. And if you have a few uh, uh, minutes to kill at uh, one lunchtime, I won't say in the middle of your working day, but one lunchtime, just fly in over Google Earth and, and look at the Bohai Sea coast and you'll find that there is more of it looks like that now than uh, looks natural in, in any sense of the word. And then another growing influence that we're having on the sea is underwater noise. And, uh, you know, Cousteau didn't feel that he was um, stretching things too far to call the underwater environment the silent world in the 1950s when he wrote his first book. But it has become a lot noisier since then. And, uh, and the noise has grown with the amount of global trade and globalization. You can see um, all of these uh, areas, are, are the volume of shipping traffic, those are the great noise hotspots in the ocean as well. And that noise is influencing marine life and it's making it hard for marine mammals like this, uh, this uh, uh, northern right whale. Is it a northern right whale or a fin whale? Northern right whale, thank you. I thought it was, an <laughs> it should be a northern right whale. Anyway, somebody here probably took the photograph, but uh, they, they are coming into close contact with the shipping on these shipping lanes. And uh, the, the, the problem there is that quite a lot of them appear to be having trouble hearing. And uh, if you look at stranded dolphins on the coast of Florida, something like two thirds of them have hearing loss, which would be considered to be profound in humans. And uh, that may be one of the reasons why they're stranding. And it may also be one of the reasons why uh, uh, whales cut it rather fine when it comes to getting out of the way of boats. And here you can see one that has only just made it. And uh, if you look closely beside it, there's this little puff of brown in the water. Huh? I wonder what that might be. <laughs> That's the oh shit moment. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have uh, the, uh, uh, the other side of the carbon dioxide emission coin, and that is the, the, the fact is that the oceans have spared us a lot of global warming on land to date by absorbing a large amount of the carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and 
that has come at a cost, though, uh, and it may turn out to be a rather poor bargain because in increasing ocean acidity, it's making life extremely hard for all the calcium carbonate secreting organisms out there, and uh, it turns out that they are very important. And if we look at uh, a, a natural analog of the increased acidity of the oceans from Papua New Guinea, um, here you can see some carbon di dioxide springs bubbling forth. And um, this, this, this is about the kind of acidity that we will reach by century's end under a business as usual scenario. And you know, it looks quite good, but there's a lot less coral there uh, than there is in this area, which is very close by, but otherwise unaffected by carbon dioxide. And if you look closely underneath these coral heads, the exposed carbonate has been dissolved away. So it's kind of a hollow shell. It's not a cohesive reef in the way that the, uh, the healthy area is. And then things go catastrophically wrong once we, once we uh, are pumping uh, acidity levels up much higher. Unfortunately, there's a whole bunch of plankton as well, which are uh, going to be affected by acidification. And they play critical roles, many of them, in oceanic food webs. And here you have the um, uh, th things which are phytoplankton, the primary producers. Here's a major transition food source between the phytoplankton and the uh, fish, like pollock and salmon, the pteropods, these little mollusks. And we don't know whether losses in these will be compensated for by by gains in things like diatoms, for example, uh, or cyanobacteria, which are also able to photosynthesize. So there's a, a great deal of uncertainty. And uh, there is a possibility that there will be a, an impact on the productivity of the oceans, which ultimately will affect their ability to sustain not just their life, but our life as well and our fisheries. There's another reason, though, why oceanic productivity is declining, and that's a simple physical reason, and, and that is that the the oceans really have a two-layer structure, and the, the top layer is warm, and the, the deeper layers are cooler. And that warm layer is where all the, the, the light is, and where all the photosynthesis takes place, but it's extremely nutrient poor. The nutrients are down below, and so if you're going to get good productivity, you need mixing of the nutrients. But the warming of the oceans is making that warm layer more stable and reducing the mixing. So we're seeing an expansion of the oceanic deserts, these areas of extremely low productivity. And uh, here you can see that, that the red areas essentially are the areas of expansion over a period of, decade of, uh, of a decade or so of uh, those oceanic deserts. Now just while all this is going on, we have discovered the joys of seafood as a health food. And uh, you know, we all want to live long, healthy lives. And of course, uh, you know, we're all plankton-fed fed creatures by evolution. Our nervous systems are built from all these essential fatty acids which are in aquatic foods. And so uh, it's obvious that we should eat more. And um, the trouble is that supplies are not keeping up with demand, certainly from wild sources. And if you look at the per capita availability of uh, seafood to people on this planet. This is what it looks like. So the, this is the wild food, is the black uh, circles. And you can see that it has been in decline since 1970. And that's a result not just of the decline in fisheries, but also the increase in human population since the 1970s. Now, aquaculture has bailed us out so far in that it has actually produced a net increase in seafood avail availability, albeit a very modest one. Now, this is uh, the amount that uh, we are recommended to eat uh, in seafood every week. We are way below that in terms of availability at a worldwide scale. The United States recommends even more, 340 grams, so we're up somewhere here. So seafood is in short supply, and uh, that's, that's going to, to cause difficulties for us. And the squeeze in seafood is happening because of all of these different ways in which the oceans are changing. And uh, it, it, this is really a very simplified diagram. And uh, uh, in, in fact, it should more properly look something like this when you start taking into, action, I, into account the interactive effects between these different, different things. And then, of course, you know, just when we want to, to, to eat more seafood, we're starting to develop scruples about sustainability. And is it sustainable? And the, if uh, I was the, the, the fishmonger here in this 400-year-old uh, painting, I, I would say something along this line. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So what will the future oceans be like? And, uh, you know, I can't resist putting in this. It's the only time I have ever bumped Obama. <laughs> it is the only time I will ever bump Obama. On the Newsweek cover in uh, the United States, there was a picture of uh, Barack Obama with a halo and saying that America's first gay president. And there was a little thing at the top saying, get ready to eat jellyfish. Well, here is the international edition. <laughs> the jellyfish takes precedent over your president. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. So the thing to remember is that we are not going to run out of living things in the oceans. The oceans will do just fine through all of these changes. Geological history tells us this. There will be winners and losers, and the winners will likely be the sorts of things like jellyfishes that enjoy a bit of warming, that don't have calcium carbonate skeletons, whose predators are largely history, and uh, who love the broth of nutrients that we're enriching the water with. And so, you know, in, in, in the case of jellyfish, the, the, the changes that are underway could not have been better designed uh, to, to promote their abundance. Uh, but before we get too keen on jellyfish, let us just take a little uh, uh, lesson from the leatherback who specializes on jellyfish, and that is that they're rather low calorie. And uh, in order to break even, uh, leatherbacks have to eat half of their body weight every day in jellyfish. So you can imagine being in a meeting like this and everybody would have their, their sack of jellyfish and you know, they'd be munching away. <laughs> We'd be browsing all the time on jellyfish, just... <laughs> hopping up and down to the restrooms. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> or are we going to turn things around and, uh, and, and turn back the clock a little bit and have something of the old abundance and the, and the tasty, high quality food that we've grown used to? Well, the, the big challenges to turning things around are that the, the drivers of change in the oceans are not going to get better. Uh, before they get worse. And, and the two biggest ones are the ones that we have most signally failed to grasp uh, uh, over the past decades, and that is human population growth and the increasing affluence of human societies and uh, the effects that that has on energy use and the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And we're going to have to control and deal with those things if the oceans and our species are going to have any chance at all. So I have to take that as a given. But we're seeing now the emergence of many of the, the symptoms of the rising stresses in the, in the oceans. And just to give you a few examples from around the country, we've got the toxic red tides in Florida, we've got uh, increasing anoxia, the jellyfish plagues, the, the junk food uh, of the albatross chicks, anoxia in Oregon, uh, flesh-eating microbes in Chesapeake, uh, futile attempts to deal with the uh, depletion of coral reefs in Florida, um, uh, sick dolphins whose bodies are, are now loaded up with toxins of various sorts, um, rising sea levels becoming manifest, uh, uh, areas where there, there is no such thing as a natural coastal habitat anymore, uh, introduced invasive species, more red tides, rotting heaps of seaweed on uh, uh, the beaches of Washington, and wetland disintegration as sea levels rise. So all of these things are symptoms of the, of the collective of changes that is going on. So what can we do about it? Well, the problem is that in, in exploiting uh, and using the sea, we have tended to extract and not to nurture and to uh, sustain. And we need to change that. We need to reinvent what it means to be human and uh, uh, go from being a species that has traditionally, for 200,000 years, gone around using resources and then moving on to something which nurtures the resources that it has and uh, uses them in a sustainable way. And what I would argue is that we need to uh, breathe life back into our ocean ecosystems and reduce stresses in order to give it the best chance of seeing through the tough times ahead. We've got a crunch coming mid-century or so in terms of the, 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 the drivers of ocean change. And we need to prepare by giving ocean life the best chance. And that means increasing abundance, raising abundance uh, a great deal more uh, than it, it currently exists at. It doesn't mean cleaning out the Irish Sea down to the last two or three scallops. So I, I would suggest we need a new deal for the oceans, and uh, that means to me more in the way of well-protected marine reserves. These are 
areas not of the, 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 the the typical sort of protected areas that people around the world like to create, which is, you know, draw a line on a map and then forget about it and say the job's done, but real protected areas, ones that offer a high level of, of protection against exploitation. And then in the rest, it's no, lo no use going on as if business as usual was fine, we've got to fish less and using less destructive gears. And I would argue that we need an outright ban on fishing deeper than half a mile down because the, the animals and the habitats down there are so unproductive uh, that it really isn't worth our while. We're, we're undertaking mining operations in the deep sea right now and they're unsustainable. We're just using up the resources uh, with uh, a great collateral impact. And we need a blue revolution in agriculture if we are going to see uh, enough food for people, if we're going to see the, the continuing increase of uh, seafood availability to people. But it has to be in a different way from the way that we're doing it right now, because that has a huge amount of collateral impacts, for example, on these critical coastal habitats. And as a pa package of stress reduction, we have to redouble our efforts to, to reduce and remove the various kinds of pollutants in the oceans, including you know, uh, the, the, the typical toxic chemicals and agricultural runoff and the nutrient pollution, but also the things like plastics, which are becoming more and more uh, a problem. So will this cost us in terms of uh, seafood supplies? Uh, well, the answer is I don't think it will. And you can see that from this little diagram typical uh, graph of catch versus fishing effort. As you increase fishing effort, to begin with, you're rewarded with increasing catches. Um, as you, you fish down a big uh, population of senescent old, old farts, and then uh, you, 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 know, you, you get the population dominated by the smaller, faster growing animals. Uh, but if you go too far, you end up with uh, uh, greatly reduced catches and a crash population. And so the sweet spot is this maximum sustainable yield. Now, at the, if, you, if you imagine this in terms of a dial with the, the, with the, the benefits of uh, different positions on here, uh, this is pretty much where we're fishing many stocks at the moment. We're right over in the over-exploitation phase. It costs us a lot. We have to subsidize those industries. It has a big impact on the stocks and uh, low, um, a, a big impact on habitats. And so. Fortunately, our uh, uh, leaders around the world have committed to uh, managing for MSY, maximum sustainable yield, by 2015, um, or at least the nearest that they can get by that point. But I, I would argue that we need to be going for MSY plus and rebuilding populations up beyond that. We would lose very little in the way of catches, but we would gain an enormous amount in terms of the integrity of ocean ecosystems. And here's just a, a very simple illustration of why fishing less means catching more. If you imagine this is our stocks of fish in the sea, um, and we have uh, a relatively low stock of fish in the sea, this is what we can sustainably take from it. So that's the deposit in the bank account, that's the interest rate. If we don't have much in the bank, we're not going to be able to take much from it. But rebuilding that population up to a much greater level will increase the amount that we can sustainably take from it. And so by fishing less, we can catch more at less expense and with less impact. So I shall leave you on that positive note and uh, remind you, as I have been told to, that uh, the ocean of life is available <laughs> from this corner table. And, uh, and Jeb said it was on special at $2 a, a book, wasn't it? <laughs> Not at all. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>
our colleagues in uh, Australia, and even in 1990, we had a massive bleaching event again in um, the, the wider Caribbean. Nothing in the Pacific to m much uh, extent. And it wasn't until 97, 98 that the reefs bleached in the Indo-West Pacific and all in the region that our Australian colleagues opened up. But for so very long, we couldn't get anyone's attention, mm -hmm. even when our reefs were stark white. And people were going out and they'd see the reefs stark white. Couldn't get people angry about it, couldn't get people to respond. And even after the reefs bleached in 80, uh, 97, 98 globally, I'll get to my question here, my point. <laughs> It was it's a very um, good comment for now. So but we'll but, 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 <laughs> but it, it, it. when they bleached globally, we still, within the coral uh, community, debated whether it was climate change or other things. It was still being debated. The point that you made about ocean acidification and the point that I've been trying, and I, I'd like your reaction to this, I am terrified because it's, it's not visible. It's very, it's, you won't notice it until we are feeling the effects and seeing the effects. And I think we're already seeing the effects in many areas and hot spots. What is your, how are we going to get the word out? How are we going to get people mm -hmm. even more terrified about ocean acidification when we couldn't, when the reefs were stark white? How mm -hmm. are we going to do it? Well, I think it comes down to, to our well-being ultimately. And that's, that's the argument I'm trying to make in the book is that uh, the oceans occupy more than 95% of the, of the volume of the biosphere. And, uh, you know, Brian Scarry made that point very clearly this morning. Um, they are overwhelmingly important in the maintenance of the livability of this planet. And we ignore that fact at our peril. Uh, and I think that we have got to communicate that much more widely, that if the oceans go to hell, then that means we go to hell too. And, and Sylvia Earle has been making exactly the same point for a long time. And, you know, it, it, Thinking about the um, the carbonate problem in the uh, in the poles, they're, they're the areas that are going to go undersaturated in terms of their carbonate first. Uh, they're, they're, um, their carbonate becomes undersaturated at a very shallow depth, probably 50, 100 meters deep at the moment. And, and that uh, horizon is rising towards the surface until we will be all undersaturated there. And that's when the pteropods are going to get it really in the neck. Um, you know, they're already being squeezed I I into a, a thinner and thinner layer. But, you know, we can, we can see that as, as the opening up of a carbonate hole at the poles in perhaps a similar way to the opening up of the ozone uh, hole in the atmosphere at the poles. Uh, and I think we need to try and find compelling ways to take the arguments. And if you don't give a, a stuff about pteropods, uh, then maybe you like pollock and maybe you like uh, salmon, uh, and those are animals that intimately depend on having a good, healthy diet of pteropods. Uh, and so do all the whales, uh, you know, well, various whales um, enjoy a good pteropod snack from time to time. So I, I, I think we, we need to communicate more effectively that, uh, that, that acidification doesn't just threaten pretty coral reefs somewhere. It is actually undermining the very stuff of life in the sea, the food webs, the base of the food web is going to crumble potentially as a result of acidification. And the trouble with acidification is it's irreversible on thousands of year time scales. So what we, what we get in the way of acidity rising is going to stay there for a very, very long time. So uh, that, that tells us that we should really act now uh, and act very decisively to escape the worst, even if it doesn't turn out that the worst, <laughs> you know, the, the, the worst is not as bad as we thought. We, we, we come back to Pascal's wager, uh, which was uh, something to the effect, if I try and remember, you know, what if God doesn't exist? and I spend all my life being pious, uh, you know, what, what's it going to have cost me to be pious uh, and then find out that God doesn't exist? But if God does exist and I spend all my life not being pious and just go around hell-raising, uh, then I have eternity of damnation to put up with um, in, in the hereafter. Uh, and so, you know, we need to th act in a precautionary way <laughs> Keeping in mind Pascal's wager, uh, uh, because you know things could be really nasty, and, and uh, geological history gives us plenty of precedents for that nastiness. I indeed, ocean acidification and deoxygenation, which I didn't talk about, but is happening, um, were, were major parts of the mass extinction events. Several of the mass extinction events. It's a long answer, but I, I apologise oh, for that. Oh, 
Hi, this is Phil, Phil Williams. I just had one observation on to Billy's, add on Billy's question. The U.S. government is going to be listing probably about 80 species of corals now in the Pacific and the, and the Caribbean. And the, co the main causes are climate change for their decline. But uh, whether that is the alert that would get the U.S. government to take a leadership role in a bigger picture mm. that you're talking about is cer certainly up for debate still. But well, I hope so. And, you know, I hope you use that uh, as, a, as one just one lever to try and increase attention to it. Uh, it's a very important one. Yeah. Hey, thanks again for a great talk. Um, referring to the, the Mahi bycatch study in Costa Rica, I thought that was particularly disturbing, and especially with, with that species in particular because they're discarded by the thousands in the tuna per sand fishery, Mahi. Right. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about a multi-species fishery or maybe even a mandate to, to keep these bycatch, bycaught species so that we're not throwing away swordfish for a mahi fishery and throwing away mahi for a tuna fishery. Well, I, I, I think, you know, quite a few of those are, are kept um, and they, they do have extra value. But I think that the scale of slaughter of the ocean megafauna is one of the things which I, I, I'm just most struck by with some of these highly unselective fishing techniques. The, 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 the fishing rates on many of those sharks and certainly the turtles and the, um, the sunfish and so on are going to be way beyond sustainable. You know, so this, this is bycatch that is essentially on the way out. And uh, you know, I, I, I think we, we like to measure the success of fisheries management in terms of bycatch reduction, but th that also can be a measure of the failure of fisheries management because bycatch will go down simply by elimination and, and we will, uh, you know, we will see things improve because there's nothing left to catch in a place like the Irish Sea. Uh, that's certainly the case. So, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, buyer beware at the moment with these things, but we need to get the, the word out that certain kinds of fishing methods just have too much collateral damage to, to really be warranted in use uh, uh, on a wide scale. I just don't like them. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>